Before leaving, please remember to make a contribution to all of my uh, thousands of hours of work uh, uh, here, uh, PayPal, Patreon, or fundraiser in the description below or on the China Rising Radio Sinoland art article page. Thank you. Expose HSBC is the 800 pound gorilla in the Canadian courtroom that no one is talking about. The judicial incubus weighing on Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou's shoulders. Pictured above, HSBC is in the room, but no one is taking notice. Note before starting, hats off to CGTN for their excellent video, The Untold Story of Meng Wanzhou. I referred to it extensively to expand my research. Links to previous Meng Wanzhou and Huawei exposés, audiovisual database, Huawei-related China Rising Radio Sinoland and China Tech News Flash hyperlinks are at the end of this article. So if you are watching or listening, you need to get to the original page on China Rising Radio Sinoland. There's tons and tons of, uh, of hyperlinks throughout this article. Yeah, that 800-pound gorilla. Pictured above, Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, more commonly known as HSBC, was Queen Victoria's illegal opium money laundry machine to wash billions in drug cartel money at the expense of addicted Chinese people, 1839 to 1949. Today with the City of London, not much has changed since then through Queen Elizabeth II. To the right, Meng Wanzhou's entry card when she was kidnapped at Vancouver Airport at the demand of the USA, 1 December 2018. Here we go. <clears throat> I have always loved the oblique, hyperbolic metaphor in English, the 800-pound gorilla, usually in the room or in the corner. It usually concerns a discussion or debate. The participants talk and talk about the obvious big ticket points at the exclusion of what everyone wants to avoid addressing, pretending that it is not important to find a solution or answer. That is your invisible 800 pound King Kong. A good example is China and US relations, yet avoiding any mention of North Korea. Fearless, independent, unoccupied DPRK is the Sino-American 800 pound gorilla, that unspoken cipher which always seems to get swept under the rug, but is not going away. Another one would be Russia and Europe, yet not wanting to connect the obvious dots to that hugely influential Persian hulk sitting unrecognized next door, Iran. The Islamic Socialist Republic's principled influence is outsized by several magnitudes, and deservedly so. Which brings us to an altogether different 800-pound gorilla, at least as far as Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou is concerned, Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, better known by its abbreviation HSBC. Subtitle, a quick recap on Meng Wanzhou's story. Pictured above, CCTV outtake of Meng Wanzhou, front while being arrested in Vancouver Airport, 1 December 2018. Ms. Mung was apprehended in Vancouver, Canada on 1 December 2018 at the behest of the United States to be extradited south of the 49th parallel. Since then, she has been battling in court and in the headlines to show, the US char to show that U.S. charges of fraud are unfounded and that she should be released. Since that time, Ms. Mung has been under house arrest in Vancouver for 2.5 years, grinding out endless testimonies, cross-examinations, and now a series of U.S., Canadian versus Mung legal team hearings in the British Columbia Supreme Court. Subheading, we are not a part of this case. It would be inappropriate for us to comment. HSBC provided objective facts to the U.S. Department of Justice. This was released by HSBC on 16 July 2020. 
What is so incredible about this high-profile, very Sino-American geopolitical jousting match is how incredibly involved HSBC was from the start, and nevertheless, it continues to fly under, over, through, and around Western mainstream media like the perfect computer model stealth fighter. HSBC and Mung in the same headline? Eh, virtually nada. Subheading. It's a long story, so let's keep it short. Pictured above a typical HSBC bank branch storefront seen all over the world. HSBC is not just any bank. It is Europe's largest financial institution and has held this pole position since 2017. No surprise then that it is also a global top 10 behemoth. What makes HSBC so deliciously bad is its origins in raison d'etre. As detailed in the China Trilogy, the three books that I've written so far on China, 19th century British Queen Victoria and all subsequent, subsequent royals have bragging rights to being history's grandest king, queen, pen, drug dealers running the world's longest lasting, biggest criminal global enterprise. From 1839 to 1949, they shamelessly and venally pushed mountains of opium and later morphine and heroin after they were invented onto, by some reports, up to 25% of uh, China's population. This Chinese, quote, century of humiliation lasted from the first opium war in 1839 until communist liberation in 1949. It was such a traumatic and devastating experience for the Chinese nation that every post-liberation leader from Mao Zedong to Xi Jinping always frames the start of China's long march back to global prominence from 1839. In 5,000 years of recorded history, 1839 was the people's nadir. Pictured above, poster of the 1997 Chinese historic epic novel, The Opium War. It was released to coincide with Hong Kong's return to, the, to mainland China that same year. All of those illegal drugs going into China and boatloads of Chinese silver, tea, silk, porcelain, clocks, furniture, and many other high-value products going out to Britain's vast global empire represented over the decades trillions of dollars of today's pounds, euros, dollars, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of contracts with an equal number of payor and payee transactions. Queen Victoria's solution to launder all this ill-gotten wealth was to create Hong Kong and Shanghai, Shanghai Bank in 1865 based in London. Thoroughly Western, in spite of its duplicitous moniker, HSBC was the financial appendage of the British Crown well into the 20th century, while being run under the UK's economic aegis until Hong Kong uh, was returned back to the People's Republic of China in 1997. Pictured above, the bad old drug days are the bad new money laundering ones for HSBC. HSBC has always been British, but is still very important to Hong Kong's financial affairs. It is one of only three banks that have the authority to mint Hong Kong currency. currency. It goes without saying that having the power to mint a currency is a fabulous advantage to launder and move money, much of which comes from illegal drug sales. Subheading, old drug dealing and money laundering habits die hard. Pictured above, HSBC is one of only three banks permitted to mint the Hong Kong dollar, which opens all kinds of opportunities to launder money. Which brings us to HSBC's corporate governance, and it is not a pretty picture. After a century of drug cartels and their highly profitable money laundering, old, lazy, criminal habits die hard. In a 2016 article, right when the Meng, Wanzhou, Huawei, come HSBC drama was coalescing in Washington, D.C., 
Even Uber establishment Forbes had to note all the regulatory investigations pending actual civil and criminal lawsuits that HSBC was facing. And I quote from that Forbes article, Reading it reminded me of Loprello's catalog of Don Giovanni's conquests in Mozart's opera of that name. In Italy, 640. In Germany, 231. 100 in France. In Turkey, 91. But in Spain, there are already 1,003. Like Don Giovanni, better known under the Spanish form of his name, Don Juan, it appears HSBC is responsible for multiple violations in multiple countries. The list is as long as your arm. Wherever there is some dodgy scam going on in the world, HSBC is likely to have a finger in it. That was from a Forbes article. <laughs> HSBC's 2015 media release contained a section on quote, legal proceedings and regulatory matters. In it, HSBC is unrepentant to its historical drug cartel core, stating, HSBC is party to legal proceedings and regulatory matters in a number of jurisdictions arising out of its normal business operations. Apart from the matters described below, HSBC considers that none of these matters are material. <laughs> normal business operations. At least they got that right. Financial crimes are immaterial. Go figure. The following concerns are listed after this cheeky preamble. Anti-money laundering and sanctions related matters. Bernard L. Madoff, Investment Securities, LLC. Credit default swap, regulatory investigation and litigation. Economic Plans, HSBC Bank Brazil, SA. European Interbank Offered Rates and Other Benchmark Interest Rate Investigations and Litigation. Fédération Internationale de Football Association, FIFA Related Investigations. Foreign Exchange Rate Investigations and Litigation. Hiring Practices Investigation. London Interbank Offered Rates, Precious Metal Fix-Related Litigation and Investigations, Regulatory Review of Consumer Enhancement Service Products, <laughs> Securities Litigation, Tax-Related Investigations, U.S. Mortgage Securitization Activity and Litigation, and finally U.S. Mortgage-Related Investigations. Gosh, did they leave anything out? All that seems to be missing is a Hollywood couch rapist Harvey Weinstein or a pedophile pusher for the powerful Jeffrey Epstein. Mind you, <laughs> these summary headings add up to many thousands of cases and do not, include, uh, do not include the ones that never see the light of day. Sometimes if you don't laugh, you cry. <laughs> All right, subheading, bring on the dope and rake in the cash. Pictured above, mon drugs and money laundering go together like a hot dog and a bun. It was the first item above, anti-money laundering, where Meng Wanzhou unknowingly entered the picture against her will. From 2006 to 2010, HSBC USA flagrantly opened the money laundering floodgates. As a result, in 2012, U.S. prosecutors charged H HSBC with high crimes, including drug cartel money laundering in Mexico, amounting to at least $881 million. It was fined $1.9 billion, and in December 2012, it agreed to a five-year DPA, uh, which is the abbreviation for Deferred Prosecution Agreement, to clean up their act and cooperate with any and all U.S. investigations. An attorney, an assistant attorney general, Lanny Brewer, opined, saying, HSBC is being held accountable for stunning failures of oversight and worse. 
that led the bank to permit narcotics traffickers and others to launder hundreds of millions of dollars through HSBC subsidiaries and to facilitate hundreds of millions more in transactions with sanctioned countries. It was the third time in 10 years where HSBC had been prosecuted for similar crimes. Subheading, DPAs, oh joy! Uh, and then there's a picture of a Monopoly card. No coincidence that the Monopoly card shows a rich fat cat getting off scot-free. It happens all the time. You know, the Monopoly game is the community chest get out of jail free card. What are these DPAs? In essence, they are high level plea bargains for the rich and powerful while likely getting handed a Monopoly game get out of jail for free card as part of the deal. Sell one too many dime bags of crack to an informant you are going down, brother, into the hole for a long, long time, maybe for the rest of your life. However, that is not what happens to really serious bad guys like HSBC. Just like street corner snitches, all they have to do is think and set up USA's perceived enemies, Huawei and Meng Wanzhou in HS HSBC's case, which this expose strongly suggests they did. All those many millions of Americans trapped in the penal system usually have a hard-nosed, zero-tolerance parole officer just waiting to throw them back in lockup. Companies that sign a DPA, which usually lasts for five years, have a compliance monitor to track whether they are cleaning up their dirty work. In 2012, Michael Cherkasky, executive chairman and head of Exeger Government Services, was named HSBC's compliance monitor. Not surprisingly, given its cavalier attitude, Cherkasky's report to US DOJ in 2016 found potential financial crimes, and he was worried whether HSBC was adhering to all of its DPA obligations. Funny how things work out. In late 2016, HSBC started an internal probe specifically targeting Huawei. This included gathering possible incriminating evidence on the relationship between Skycom and Iran, Iran or Iran and Huawei. Why Huawei, Skycom, and at that time? These two ICT entities including three of U include three of USA's most feared adversaries, Huawei, China, and Iran. Talk about a geopolitical hat trick. This while HSBC admitted at the time to thousands of ongoing regulatory concerns, yet HSBC explicitly went after Huawei at the expense of all its other clients. Was HSBC prompted in this direction? HSBC's DPA clearly states, clearly states, HSBC is to cooperate with the Department of Justice in any and all investigations. Remember that get out of jail for free card for the rich and powerful. All you have to do is provide, quote, useful information to the feds, and then you can walk away. Funny how things keep working out. In February 2017, U.S. Departments of Justice, Treasury, Commerce, and Homeland Security were said to have had a tete-a-tete -tete on the Potomac to discuss progr progress in confronting Huawei, including its business dealings with HSBC. Keep in mind, Trump had only been in the White House for a month. At that time, Peter Navarro, a proud Sinophobe, was his director of the National Trade Council. Steve Bannon, another, quote, howling at the yellow moon, end of quote, fanatic, was White House chief strategist and senior counselor to the president. Mike Pompeo, who foams at the mouth whenever China is mentioned, was director of Central Intelligence Agency, and a year and a half later became Trump's bash 
Beware of the yellow peril, Secretary of State. Pictured above, four of the biggest sinophobes on the Potomac. We could add John Bolton. Top left is Mike Pompeo conferring with Donald Trump to his left. Bottom left is Peter Navarro and bottom right, Steve Bannon. What a motley group. Were they there? Did they send briefs or persons from their offices to participate? Nonetheless, their presence in the new Trump administration surely set the anti-China tone. At the same time, HSBC started giving a series of presentations to U.S. DOJ, Department of Justice, about Huawei and Skycom based on what they found in their files. The HSB show and tell, show and tells lasted until the end of 2017, more than a year. Pictured above, page 6 and 16 of Mung's PowerPoint presentation, which were conveniently left out of U.S. DOJ's fraud indictment. Why? Because they prove the charges are false. Hmm. I wonder if Mung's now infamous HK PowerPoint presentation was in the mix of what HSB found, uh, HSBC found when they did their unique investigation into Huawei and Skycom. Interestingly, up until that time, the U.S. never cited Huawei for noncompliance or breaking American laws. Wilbur Ross, then Secretary of the U.S. Department of Commerce, USDOC, stated in a June 2018 interview that, quote, I've heard lots of rumors about Huawei. As of the moment, I don't believe that our de department has found any violations of Huawei. So said Wilbur Ross. Clearly, Ross did not know that U.S. DOJ and Treasury were working overtime to, quote, confront Huawei. Eight months later, he jumped onto the Trump anti-China bandwagon, singing his praises to the president, now calling the Chinese criminal during U.S. DOJ's press conference announcing its prosecution of Huawei and Meng Wanzhou. It is clear that Trump and company were itching to take on China Inc. and Huawei was a big fat target from day one. In truth, targeting Huawei began even earlier under Obama. Nonetheless, kidnapping Meng Wanzhou in Vancouver Airport on 1 December 2018 was just one more Machiavellian great game tactic to try to achieve their goals. It is what empires do. Subheading. Now, full circle back to that infamous Hmong HSBC meeting in 2013. Nothing about Hmong's meeting with Alan Thomas, HSBC's then Deputy Head of Global Banking for the Asia Pacific, makes any sense, and with knowledge of the first half of this expose's content, it is therefore highly suspect. First, since, we, first, since when do high-level executives meet in an openly public place to discuss internal information? Entitled Trust, Compliance, and Cooperation, CGTN reported that Mung's PowerPoint presentation was considered confidential, since it exclusively focused on Huawei's business relationship with Iranian Skycom and not the usual boilerplate compliance format for annual reports and media releases. According to the story, Mung's translator was there since she can't speak English well. Are you going to believe that they would meet in a Hong Kong restaurant? And I've been in a bunch of them and they're just swimming with, with people, te teeming with people in a Hong Kong restaurant with Chinese waiters milling about and likely Chinese guests sitting at nearby tables for all to listen in. They could have gotten a private dining room, but still local formality would have, at a minimum, called for tea and snacks to be served, which meant waiters were in and out. Friends, this was not an Amway meeting. The whole restaurant scenario is simply too preposterous to consider. 
Alan Thomas was a high-level officer of global banking giant HSBC, and Meng was and still is the CFO of the world's biggest and most successful information and communication technology company, ICT. They work in the billions of euros and dollars. Do you honestly believe that someone of Thomas's level and caliber did not get an advanced copy of the presentation to study and prepare questions and comments? The idea is beyond absurd. Next, who invited whom? HSBC divulged HSBC divulged in their sudden rush 2016 internal Huawei probe that it was Huawei that requested the meeting with Thomas. Really? Someone with apparent knowledge of what happened disagrees. On condition of anonymity in front of a camera, they said this meeting was not arranged through normal protocol channels. At Mung's and Thomas's levels, a formal invitation would have been sent via email. This was not done. HSBC has not produced any email to show it was Huawei's initiative, and neither, what, neither has Huawei, which means if Huawei accepted the invitation outside protocol channels, they were still naive back in those early days. So, how was it arranged? Can, how was it arranged? Can you picture Mung or Thomas picking up the phone and saying, Hey, let's meet at a restaurant and talk about Huawei's relationship with Iranian Skycom! Highly doubtful, but it is possible that administrative assistants could have, could have arranged the meeting by phone. In any case, given that HSBC had just signed their U.S. Department of Justice DPA, which states HSBC is to cooperate with the Department of Justice in any and all investigations, and HSBC was desperate to avoid prosecution, who do you think requested the meeting? Mung or Thomas? Huawei or HSBC? Next, HSBC Tower is kind of hard to miss in Hong Kong, and Huawei's global headquarters are in Shenzhen, just across the river, in Guangdong Province, PRC. Subheading, HSBC Tower, Hong Kong. Pictured above the beautiful, high-tech, 47-floor HSBC Tower in Hong Kong. HSBC Tower is on Queens Road, Hong Kong Island. It opened in 1985 and was designed by the British architectural firm Foster Plus Partners. I have been to Hong Kong many times and it is strikingly eye-catching. At 99,000 square meters of floor space, over a million square feet. It offers a magnificent view of the harbor below in keeping with feng, in, in keeping with feng shui requirements to assure success and wealth. Are we supposed to believe that on 22 August 2013, its many tens of meeting and conference rooms were all full? Thomas couldn't even find a small one for the CFO of mighty Huawei? Surely at his grade, his office would have been plenty big enough for Mung and her translator, maybe even looking over that fabulous harbor below. They could have met at Huawei's headquarters too. Today there are high-speed high train service and direct metro lines between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, but back in 2013, Huawei and HSBC could have gotten together on either side of the border via car, bus, train, ferry, and footbridge. I've taken them all many times. We're talking one and a half to two hours max. Very convenient. Again, the whole restaurant sh shtick is total balderdash. Next, why was Thomas sent to the meeting? He was HSBC's deputy head of banking in the Asia Pacific. HSBC, like every international entity of even modest size, has a full-time compliance and legal department. He was a deal maker, not a regulatory eager beaver. It was like asking a builder to do the job of a plumber. Why wasn't HSBC's head of compliance or regulations pegged for the meeting? Ditto Mung. As Huawei's chief financial officer, her job is to count beans. 
along with securing funding, that what uh, that that is what financial bosses do. Why didn't HSBC ask Huawei's legal expert to talk about Iranian Skycom? Song Liuping is Huawei's chief legal officer and compliance officer based in Shenzhen, maybe on the same floor as Meng. He oversees a team of more than 1,500 regulatory bloodhounds and for which the company began these efforts very early on and investing hugely to satisfy its global compliance management from senior officers on down. This while Huawei had, since 2009-2010, been in regular contact with the U.S. Department of Commerce for trade compliance, including de minimis rules, uh, CISADA, that's C-I-S-A-D-A, -S which are the list of all the U.S. sanctions, and making sure Huawei fully understood all U.S. laws as well as newly enacted laws. Song visited U.S. DOC several times for consultations and bilateral briefing. Uh, briefings took place every 18 to 24 months. Unfortunately, this stopped in 2016, three years after the Mung Thomas meeting, when Huawei learned they were being investigated by the USA. Are you trying to tell me HSBC did not know who Song Liu Ping was? Or that Huawei did not have a legal slash compliance department? Why didn't they invite Song or one of his deputy chiefs, regulatory experts all, to get it straight from the horse's mouth? Pictured above, Zhen Zhang Fei as a young man when he was in the People's Liberation Army. Is it because this horse is not Huawei founder Zhen Zheng Fei's daughter? And Meng is? Zhen was and still is reviled in Cold Warrior Washington since he is a retired People's Liberation Army PLA Deputy Regimental Leader uh, for IT, Information Technology, close to the Communist Party of China, the CPC, and is proud to share Mao Zedong thought with the company's 200,000 workers for inspiration and business insights, these latter who share in the world's largest employee-owned corporation. For anti-communist neoliberals, there's not a lot to like here. Alan Thomas has done very well for himself in the ensuing years. Today he is an HSBC trustee on the board of directors, member of Asset and Liability Committee, and member of Audit and Risk Committee. Nice cushy job. Was Thomas rewarded for a dirty deed well done? Subheading, poor pitiful HSBC. <laughs> Pictured above, the fabulous Hong Kong Island skylight, skyline at night. The tallest building in the middle is the International Commerce Center. Just to its right is the City Group Tower. Further to the right is HSBC Tower, decked out in red, and Standard Chartered is just to its right. BNP Paribas cannot be far off. These four victim institutions are peas in a pod. Incredibly, in the U.S. case to extradite Hmong from Canada, the U.S. stated that HSBC is one of four victim institutions Standard Chartered, BNP Paribas, Citigroup, along with HSBC, for exposing them to, quote, both economic and reputational risks, end of quote, and I added sick, S-I-C, as you, you, you can't believe it. Talk about Orwellian doublespeak. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. And now we can add to 1984, HSBC is the victim. Pictured above, Einar Tang Tangen is active in China-related media. Einar Tangen, a former U.S. prosecutor, mind you, did not mince his words, outraged that, quote, no, not one 
the four victim institutions. Not single one or any of them were inter interdicted at an airport and held based on a warrant. No, they were all given a pass. Not one of them is in jail. Remembering that get out of jail for free uh, card above. We are, uh, Einar continues, we are talking about criminality on a vast scale. And now you understand what was HSBC's driving force here. What they wanted to do was hand something over to the U.S. government, the Department of Justice, that would curry favor. Bingo! Which, of course, worked like a charm. Throwing clients under the proverbial imperial bus and selling them down Snitch River pays big dividends. On 11 December 2017, at the conclusion of HSBC's five-year DPA, the bank was completely exonerated of all Mexican drug cartel money laundering charges since, quote, HSBC had lived up to all its commitments to improve control and compliance measures. Another sick SIC. Can't believe it. What a coincidence! What was not mentioned sotto voce was the most important clause in HSBC's DPA. HSBC is to cooperate with the Department of Justice in any and all investigations. Einar Tangen, Tangen went on to say, this is not a game of go fish, right? The idea that we are more civilized today than we were in the past how is it possible when, in essence, he, Trump, has kidnapped her, all right? He's holding her for ransom against her father and the Chinese government and her own liberty for his own political gain. And then pictured above, some principled souls in the West know that Hmong's kidnapping is illegal. In closing, the whole Meng Wanzhou Huawei saga is a tawdry tale of imperial bullying, bullying and global capitalist treachery. HSBC has always been at the center of this story and still is. In fact, it has been in many more, going back to its founding by Queen Victoria in 1865. Appendix, Evil Deeds Done Most Foul, Ad Infinitum. HS, HSBC's criminal hiss just keep on coming. Remember, it was laughably, quote, exonerated at the end of its DPA in December 2017, yet two months before this absurd high-class indulgence, the bank was already back in the headlines. It reminds me of that classic line from the movie The Mask, this guy's incorrigible. So we can add HSBC to the mask list of bad guys. 30 September 2017, U.S. fines HSBC $175 million for lax forex trading oversight. That was before they got, got their get-out-of-jail-for-free uh, get card uh, from uh, the Department of Justice. 19 January 2018, HSBC in $100 million forex fraud settlement. 27 April 2018, ex-HSBC executive sentenced to two years for foreign exchange scheme. 21 September 2020, HSBC moved vast sums of dirt, dirty money after paying record laundering fine. From the earlier cited article, Forbes couldn't close out this sordid expose any better. From that same article, they said, what a catalog of misbehavior. It would be easy to cast HSBC as the Don Juan of banks, lecherous, amoral, and deserving to be consigned to hell. But are other big banks any better? I think not. And that was from Forbes. Postscript, poor Meng Wanzhou. I wanted to close out with a little humor, a three-minute spoof of Tracy Ullman being interviewed, but by, why not, HSBC. In the first couple of seconds, it flashes the, quote, City of London, end of quote, banking district, which is telling. And I have the, I've downloaded the movie for you uh, in the article. 
at the end, essential reading, listening, and watching exposés on Meng Wanzhou uh, and Huawei Saga. And there are the one, two, three, four uh, exposés that I have done previously. There's also the Huawei online resource collection uh, uh, on uh, China Rising Radio Sinoland and China Tech News Flash. I mean, I, there's a hundred videos and many of those are, uh, a, a bunch of those are Huawei. And then I ha probably have the best collection of Meng Wanzhou plus Huawei documents and media, free to, da free to view and download. I'm talking legal documents, you know, court, court documents, uh, I mean, just everything, videos, you name it. This is Jeff J. Brown, China Rising Radio Sinoland, signing out. Have a great day. China Rising Radio Sinoland and China Tech News Flash signing out. Please make a contribution to all of my hard work. Thank you.